Othello Part 4 No Way But This Though Othello had come to the terrible conclusion that Desdemona must die, he could not prevent his thoughts dwelling again and again on all the charm and loveliness of his dear young wife. This did not suit Iago's purpose, for he was afraid lest Othello should relent before his revenge was accomplished. So he did his utmost in every way to incite Othello still more against Desdemona. He cunningly reminded him of Brabantio's parting words, and said if Desdemona had deceived her father in concealing her affection for Othello, why should she not equally deceive her husband in concealing her affection for someone else? She shall not live. No, my heart is turned to stone. I strike it, and it hurts my hand, said Othello. Then, oh, the world hath not a sweeter creature. Nay, that's not your way, said Iago, ill-pleased. I do but say what she is, returned the fellow, so delicate with her needle, an admirable musician. Oh, she will sing the savageness out of a bear, of so high and plenteous wit and invention. She's the worse for all this, said Iago. Oh, a thousand, thousand times, agreed the fellow. Then he added wistfully, and then, of so gentle a condition. Ay, too gentle, sneered Iago. Nay, that's certain, but yet the pity of it, Iago. Oh, Iago, the pity of it, Iago! But one might better have appealed for compassion to a tiger in sight of his prey. Iago knew nothing of pity. He had only one aim in view, to gratify his revenge. If Othello would kill Desdemona, he said, he would undertake Cassio. Emilia, Iago's wife, was a sharp-tongued, outspoken woman, devoted to her young mistress, and when she saw how jealous and violent Othello was becoming, she did not scruple to tell him plainly that he was utterly wrong in his distrust. But Othello, urged on by Iago's cunning, was now past all reason. By this time he was firmly convinced that Desdemona's simple sweetness of manner was nothing but the most skilful hypocrisy, and that it was his duty to put her out of the world, so that she should betray no more people. When he spoke to his wife that day after his interview with Iago, his words were so strange and menacing that Desdemona was quite frightened. "'Upon my knees what doth your speech import?' she cried piteously. "'I understand a fury in your words, but not the words.' Othello answered with a torrent of angry accusations, which utterly bewildered Desdemona, and then he abruptly left her, while Amelia vainly tried to soothe and comfort her. This good woman was not slow to express her indignation at Othello's shameful behavior, and loudly announced her opinion that he was being deceived by some base notorious knave, some scurvy fellow. O oh, heaven, that thou wouldst make such people known! and put in every honest hand a whip to lash the rascals naked through the world, even from the east to the west, she cried with flashing eyes. This was not very pleasant hearing for Iago, who was standing by, and he harshly told Emilia she was a fool, and bade her be silent. Then when Desdemona appealed to him, asking what she should do to win her lord again, Iago pretended to think it was only a little ill temper on the fellow's part, that business of the state had offended him, and consequently he was out of humor with Desdemona. There was some color for this suggestion, for a special commission had just arrived from Venice, commanding Othello to return home, and deputing Cassio as governor of Cyprus in his place. Iago saw that, if he wanted to dispose of Cassio, there was no time to be lost, for Iago himself would be obliged to leave the island in Othello's suite. He therefore contrived to incite his feeble-minded tool, Rodrigo, to set upon Cassio in the dark that very night and murder him. The attempt, however, was not successful. Rodrigo only managed to wound Cassio, and was himself badly injured in return. Some passers-by, the messengers from Venice, hearing groans in the street, stopped to give help, but it was too dark to distinguish the sufferers. The next person to arrive on the scene was Iago himself, with a light, and coming across the wounded Rodrigo, and fearing he would betray his share in the plot, he treacherously stabbed him to death. 
Cassio was then carefully conveyed away for his wounds to be dressed. That night, when Desdemona was preparing for bed, a strange melancholy seemed to take possession of her. Amelia, who was in attendance, tried to divert her mind by getting her to join in a little idle talk, but Desdemona's thoughts were running on sad themes. My mother had a maid called Barbara, she said musingly. She was in love, and he she loved proved mad and did forsake her. She had a song of Willow, an old thing it was, but it expressed her fortune, and she died singing it. That song tonight will not go from my mind. And presently, as Amelia helped her to disrobe, Desdemona began singing in a sweet, plaintive key. The poor soul sat sighing by a sycamore tree. Sing all a green willow. Her hand on her bosom, her head on a knee. Sing willow, willow, willow. The fresh streams ran by her and murmured her moans. Sing willow, willow, willow. Her salt tears fell from her and softened the stones. Sing willow, willow, willow. Sing all a green willow must be my garland. Let nobody blame him. His scorn I approve. Nay, that's not next. Hark, who is it that knocks? It's the wind, said Emilia. Desdemona listened for a moment, then went on with her song. I called my love false love, but what said he then? Sing, willow, willow, willow. Desdemona's face faltered and stopped. Emilia's duties were done, and, bidding her good night, Desdemona let her depart and presently closed her sorrowful eyes in sleep. Now had come the moment that Othello had chosen for his dark deed. As he drew near and saw his beautiful young wife lying in all the calm repose of innocent slumber, for an instant his soul melted with pity and love, and, bending over her, he kissed her tenderly. But once more he hardened his heart by thinking of the cause that had led him to decide on such an act, and a fresh wave of jealous fury suddenly taking possession of him, he seized the pillows and held them over Desdemona until life seemed extinct. There came a furious knocking at the door. Emilia's voice was heard outside, demanding admittance. Othello paused to consider. What's best to do? If she come in, she'll sure speak to my wife. My wife, my wife! What wife? I have no wife. Oh, insupportable! Oh, heavy hour! And Othello, with a heavy groan, hid his face in his hands. Again came the knocking. I do beseech you that I may speak with you, O oh, good my lord. Othello drew the curtains of the bed and unlocked the door. Emilia, in great excitement, had come to bring the news of Rodrigo's death. As she was speaking, a strange sort of moan caught her attention. She knew her lady's voice and, rushing to the bed, tore aside the curtains. Help, help, ho, help! O oh, lady, speak again! Sweet Desdemona, O oh, sweet mistress, speak! A guiltless death I die, murmured Desdemona. Oh, who hath done this deed? Nobody, I myself. Farewell, commend me to my kind lord, O oh, farewell! And with a little sigh the gentle spirit passed away. Othello immediately declared that Desdemona had spoken falsely. It was he who had killed her. Emilia turned on him with bitterest rage and contempt, whereupon he began to explain his reasons for what he had done, saying that it was Iago who had revealed everything to him. Emilia could scarcely believe such a thing. She shouted lustily to rouse the alarm, and when, among others, Iago himself hurried in, she taxed him with what Othello had said. I told him what I thought, and told no more than what he found himself was apt and true said Iago brazenly. You told a lie, an odious damned lie, upon my soul a lie, a wicked lie, cried the distracted Emilia, and it was vain for Iago to try to silence his wife. Before everyone she proclaimed him for the villain he was. Alas, poor Othello, he began to see he had been tricked, but one point he still clung to, the handkerchief. Desdemona had certainly given away his cherished gift to Cassio, Oh, thou dull moor, cried Amelia, the handkerchief thou speakest of 
I found my chance and gave my husband, for often with solemn earnestness he begged of me to steal it. She give it to Cassio? No, alas, I found it, and I gave it to my husband. Thou liest, said Iago. By heaven I do not, I do not, gentlemen. Furious against his wife, Iago had already tried once to stab her, but she had evaded him, and the other men in the room had protected her. He now made another attempt, which was more successful, and Amelia fell to the ground. Oh, lay me by my mistress's side, she begged, and there, a few minutes later, she died, with Desdemona's song of willow, willow, willow on her lips, and protesting with her dying breath the innocence of her dear lady. Now, indeed, the end had come for Othello, and all the anguish of unavailing remorse racked his soul. O oh, Desdemona, Desdemona dead! His heartbroken wail rang through the room. But it was all in vain now. Vain his agony of love and sorrow. Vain his pleading, vain his scalding tears. Vain the bitter scorn with which he lashed his guilty spirit. Cold, cold, pale and still lay his beautiful young wife, her ears deaf to all voices of earth, and frozen on her silent lips the smile with which she had died. Othello's power and command were taken away, and Cassio ruled in Cyprus, but little cared Othello for this, all worldly ambition was over. As the gentlemen and officers were about to leave the chamber of death, taking Iago with them as their prisoner, Othello, with a dignified gesture, stayed them. Soft you, a word or two before you go. I have done the state some service, and they know it. No more of that. I pray you in your letters, when you shall relate these unlucky deeds, speak of me as I am, nothing extenuate, nor set down aught in malice. Then you must speak of one that loved not wisely but too well, of one not easily jealous but being wrought, perplexed in the extreme, of one whose hand, like the base Indian, threw a pearl away richer than all his tribe. Set you down this, and say besides, that in Aleppo once, where a malignant and a turbaned Turk beat a Venetian and traduced the state, I took by the throat the circumcised dog, and smote him thus. And at the last word Othello plunged a dagger into his heart. With failing strength he dragged his steps to the bed, and fell on the dead body of Desdemona. I kissed thee ere I kill thee, came his dying whisper. No way but this, killing myself to die upon a kiss.